All right, well, it's 11 a.m. So I'm going to start talking. Uh, good morning, everyone. Benjamin Brown here, Chairman of the Alaska State Council on the Arts. And um, uh, we already have quite a few folks who have joined us and a few more may be coming on before we get into the substantive part of the meeting. Uh, but I just wanted to say welcome to everyone who's here. I think one of the advantages, there are many advantages to being Alaskan, but one is for a meeting of this sort, we can go around and have everyone who's participating introduce himself or herself or themselves and say what organization they're with. If we were in California or New York, we probably couldn't do that. So um, another advantage is that they love us at the National Endowment for the Arts and we were able to ask them to do this and they said yes and we're doing it. So uh, with that, um, um, I probably know most of the folks on the call, but if I don't, I am the chairman of the Alaska State Council on the Arts and I am in Juneau, actually just north of Juneau, Point Lena. And I'm looking forward to this morning um, uh, and learning more about what opportunities, uh, our new opportunities are available for arts organizations and local arts agencies from our friends at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I think the best way to do this is the baton pass. So I'll pick someone and then after that person introduces himself or herself, he or she can pass the baton to someone else. And because Nancy DeCherney is immediately to the left of one of our esteemed guests from the endowment, I'm gonna go first to her. And you're on mute, Nancy. The cat stepped on the mute button. Gosh, that cat. Um, I'm Nancy DeCherney with the Juno Arts and Humanities Council and it's great to see everyone so early in the morning. Um, it may not seem early to you, but for some of us it is. I'm gonna to go to Andrea. Hi, Nancy. Thank you very much. Andrea Noble from the Alaska State Council on the Arts and the Executive Director. And it's wonderful to see everyone today. And over to Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Olson Seville, the Interim Director for Fairbanks Arts Association. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invite. And over to Erin. I'm Erin Hollowell. I'm here in Homer. I am the executive director for Story Knife Writers Retreat and the director of the Catchmack Bay Writers Conference. I will turn it over to Ellen. Thank you, Erin. I'm Ellen Frankenstein down in Sitka. I'm here for Art Change Inc. and also for KCAW Raven Radio. And I'm going to pass this to Laura. I'm going to find my unmute button and say I'm Laura Forbes. I'm the Arts Education Program Director from the Alaska State Council on the Arts. And I will toss to Reggie Shep. Hi, I'm Reggie Shep. And for some reason, my video is not working. I'm with the Juno Arts and Humanities Council's Operation Manager. And I'm going to toss it to Gail. Hello, I'm Gail Jackson. I'm a local artist in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm here to gain more information and knowledge and possible collaboration with other organizations. And I pass it to Andy. Hi everyone, Andy Mathis from the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm the state and regional specialist, which means I work with the state arts agencies around the country and the regional groups of state arts agencies. And I was very fortunate to be in Alaska several years ago for your Poetry Out Loud program, and Nancy very kindly hosted me. And I can't see any names to call on someone. Hang on. Corrine. Thank you, Andy. I'm Corrine McVie with Anchorage Festival of Music in Anchorage. And um, we're excited to learn about the opportunities that might be available through NEA. And I'll pass it to Charles. Hi, I'm Charles Sears. I'm the Community Arts Program Director here at ASCA um, and also excited about what everyone can learn today. Um, I will pass it to Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Fortier and I'm the Executive Director for Juno Jazz and Classics. And it's good to see everybody. Uh, how about Frank? Hi everyone, I'm Frank Delaney. I am the Managing Director at uh, Perseverance Theater. Um, for those that don't know, we produce both in Juno and Anchorage and I'm currently in Juno and excited to learn all kinds of new fun stuff about this new fun uh, program. And I will hand it over to, how about uh, Jean? 
Hi, I'm Jeannie Kiriyama here, a retired teacher here in Haines, and I am on the board for the Alaska Arts Education Consortium. And I'll pass it to Katura. Thank you very much, Jeannie. My name is Katura Willingham. I'm the president of the board of directors for Out North Arts Organization here in Anchorage. And I think I really like this name, so I'm going to pass it to Burl Sheldon. My name is Burl Sheldon. I'm the accounting person and the grants administrator for the Haynes Sheldon Museum in beautiful Haynes, Alaska. Oh, yes. Um, do, 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 do. Thea. Uh, Thea. Hi, I'm Thea Lawton. I work for Quantic Broadcast Corporation and KNBA FM in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, I'm kind of losing track, but Shotzi, have you talked already? I have not. Hi, I'm Shotzi Schaefer's and general manager of Sierra Nose Theater Company here in Anchorage. Um, I'm also not sure who's gone yet. How about Katie in Kodiak? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Oliver. I'm the executive director of the Kodiak Arts Council. We're the local arts agency for Kodiak Island. And I will pass it to... I just saw Andrew in Valdez. Andrew. Hi, everyone. I am Andrew Goldstein. I am the curator of collections and exhibits for the Valdez Museum and Historical Archive. We produce um, both uh, history exhibits and uh, exhibits of local arts and culture. And uh, I'm glad to be here to uh, learn more. Um, so I will pass it over to Triumvirate Theater. No? Oh, I think they left, okay. Um, how about, uh, sorry about that. Um, Tim, Larice, and Megan haven't gone. Okay, uh, pass it over to Megan. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Johnson. Um, sorry, I'll see if I can get my camera working. I'm traveling <laughs> today. Um, I am with Juno Alaska Music Matters Jam. Um, we provide um, in school and after school uh, music education, arts education um, throughout Juno Alaska uh, for kindergarten through high school students. Oh, and um, I'm sorry, I think there were just a couple left and I jumped in late. So I'm not sure who is left to speak. Uh, Tim and Larice, and I'm not sure I'm saying Larice's name correctly. Larice. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, it's Larice Egley. Um, I am a full-time practicing artist out in Naknek, Alaska. I primarily specialize in social impact design. So I actually partner um, with a lot of organizations, um, tribal groups, um, um, and in schools um, to do um, art and design explorations um, that augment our local history and culture. So I'm just curious about what um, what programs are available and grant opportunities that I might be able to bring to some of our local nonprofits um, to continue my work. All right, I think we're down to Tim, Triumvirate Theater and Anne are the three remaining people who have not introduced themselves. So I'm going to usurp the baton and ask um, Tim if you would introduce yourself. <laughs> And your mute button is definitely still on. So awaiting the unmuting, Triumvirate, could you say hello, please, and introduce yourself? How's everybody doing out there? Hi. Triumvirate Theater down here on the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, Anne? 
Good morning, everybody. Ann Biberman from the Fairbanks Concert Association. Sorry to be late. I had to yang out of one meeting to get to another. But uh, nice to see everybody, and thanks for doing this. Indeed. And Stacy, we haven't heard from you. I was I I was lurking. <laughs> I'm, I'm Stacy Smith. I'm actually representing um, Alaska Record Alaska Quarterly Review. Um, uh, I'm an affiliate editor with them up in Anchorage. Excellent. Well, Tim, um, if you want to introduce yourself, you're welcome to, or you could do it in the chat um, if you want to open the chat box. I think that's everyone I see in front of me. And again, aren't we glad we're not in New York or we'd be doing this for three days? So, um, well, again, welcome uh, on behalf of the Alaska State Council on the Arts. Uh, the actual agenda called for me to introduce our staff, but I'll just reiterate, Andrea Noble, our Executive Director, Laura Forbes, our Arts Education Program Director, and Charlie Sears, our Community Arts Program Director, and Tech Guru, who's made this webinar happen, um, are wonderful. You, you have most of the staff of ASCA in this meeting this morning. Ruth Frost is our new Administrative Officer, and um, we're working to become fully staffed. That's a work in progress. And I want to especially recognize our esteemed guests from our, our wonderful friends at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the newest uh, person on the staff, whom many of you probably have not met before, is Ben Kessler, the Director of Congressional Affairs. And so he's responsible for interacting with Congress, which is very important for a federal agency to make sure that the resources that we're going to learn about this morning are there for us to be able to do our work. Uh, Andy Mathis, whom I've known for at least a decade, is the state and regional specialist, and she's a delight to work with. And so, Andy, always good to see you. And Cheryl Sheely is a folk and traditional arts specialist. And so um, we're just very pleased to have three colleagues from the National Endowment for the Arts with us this morning. And they're going to be doing most of the presenting and telling us uh, what we're all here to learn this morning. Um, so at this point, I want to turn it over to Charlie. And uh, speaking of Congress and friends and great people, our good friend, Senator Lisa Murkowski, Alaska senior senator, couldn't join us this morning, but she has some words uh, here that she's recorded to share with us. Hello to you all. Lisa Murkowski here. I am happy to welcome you as you join this meeting today, hosted by the Alaska State Council on the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts. The arts, we know, are a form of expression, whether through paint, performance, sculpture, or any other medium, and they reflect our cultures, our struggles and triumphs, and our hopes. The arts can heal those wounded by war, they can keep students engaged in school, bring diverse community together, and, and really inspire us. And those are just some of the reasons that I've been a strong supporter of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Alaska State Council on the Arts. These agencies are committed to making sure the arts are part of Alaskans' daily lives, bringing the cultural, economic, social, and educational benefits to all. You'll have an opportunity today to learn more how your arts organization and community may be able to secure vital resources as Alaska and the nation continue to heal beyond the pandemic. You'll hear ways that your arts agency and community can engage in helping society come back together safely and effectively to help us heal and, and really come back together. So thank you for your interest in how these agencies can help you and your Alaskan Arts Organization return to operations and thrive in creating artistic opportunities for all Alaskans. Know that I appreciate all that you do and for all that you will do to help Alaskas continue to thrive. So take care. All right, thank you, Charlie, for uh, sharing those words from Senator Murkowski and, and Absentia. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. And so, um, Nancy, you just raised your hand and then you lowered it right away. Oh, those are applause. That's applause. Sorry, I'm not really good with the emoji things so yet. So at this point, I, before I mess anything else up, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Kessler, um, the uh, Director of Congressional Affairs for the National Endowment for the Arts. And right on schedule, we're going to get into the substance of the program. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ben, and to Andrea, and to Charlie for having us today. Um, I think all of you know, as Alaskans, just how lucky we are to have Senator Murkowski's leadership. Um, as you may know, she is ranking member on the Appropriations Subcommittee that handles the National Endowment for the Arts. Previously, she was chair of that subcommittee. She has protected us from, from all those who wish to do us harm. 
and really, and you heard her talk about really nuanced of the way that our agency works, um, referencing creative forces, which is our, um, our therapist program working with veterans and active military. Just it's just so clear that this isn't, with Senator Murkowski, it's not someone who just loosely supports our agency. She really understands our work and we're so grateful to have her. And thank you again to, to Ben, who I know uh, close with the Senator and, and made that welcome happen. So thank you to Ben and again to, to Andrea and Charlie um, for having us today. So I think we're gonna share some slides, Charlie, if that's okay. I think while we wait for, for Charlie to bring those slides up, um, I can just get started and tell us go through a little bit about why we're here. And, and really the goal is not only to provide a deep dive into the upcoming American Rescue Plan funding opportunity, but really to demystify the National Endowment for the Arts and our application process. We want you to leave this meeting knowing that an NEA grant is within your reach and that you have detected, there we go. And Charlie, if you don't mind just going to the next slide, please. Perfect, thank you so much. So just to back up a little bit, we are gonna talk about the American Rescue Plan funding and it's August 12th first step deadline, but we really want to, you to have a sense of all of our work and our application process. And so that you leave here today knowing that an NEA grant is within your reach and that you have the technical assistance tools that you need that you're in a position to succeed when you choose to apply. And really what's front of mind when I talk about technical assistance for my colleagues and me is this uh, schedule of open Zoom office hours that we have scheduled. So it'll look like, just like the Zoom room that we're in, you'll be greeted by a couple of my colleagues and they're just there to answer any questions you have. And I'm gonna put the link in the chat and we'll hit you over the head with this schedule over and over again as we present to you. But we just think it's so important. Come with any question, no question too small. Um, chances are if you're thinking it's someone else's too, come just to listen. Register for all of them, register for one. We just really hope to see you there. As, as we know, what we're gonna um, bombard you with a lot of information and the question might not come to you while we're here today. So just the most important thing is to stay in touch throughout the process. And during the presentation, we'll provide a general overview of the NEA, all of the grant programs we offer, and then get into the details about the upcoming opportunity with that August 12th deadline. And we'll make sure that we have time for questions as well. If you could just go to the next slide, please, Charlie. Thank you so much and a little bit on how we got here. So in addition to our regular grant programs, as part of the American Rescue Plan, the National Endowment for the Arts will distribute roughly, <coughs> excuse me, roughly $135 million. And of that amount, 40% has been allocated to the state and regional arts organizations. So of course, you'd be applying um, through Ben, through Andrea, as well as us, and, and of course, West Staff too, the regional arts organization, um, and at the local level through local arts agencies, and we can handle questions about how to apply through each one of those, um, but we just wanna make sure that you're applying broadly. We're excited at the opportunity to distribute those funds, but we know that there's tremendous need in the field and we won't be able to meet, we won't be able to fulfill every application. So we just wanna make sure that you're putting yourself in a position that you could make yourself whole and come out on the other side of the pandemic ready to, to open your doors, welcome people in and, and create art. Uh, and we'll distribute the remaining 60%, to arts organizations and local arts agencies. And that's really what we'll focus here today. Funding will be available for general operating support. And we'll talk about exactly what that means and why that's different from our regular process. And guidelines are available on our website now. So if you haven't checked it out, please do and get started as soon as possible. And we're really working to make sure this fund reaches a broad constituency, including organizations in parts of the country traditionally underserved by government, organizations with small and medium-sized budgets, organizations from rural to urban communities and organizations that may be applying for federal funding for the first time. And we understand that if you're diving into this process for the first time, you're gonna need a little bit of extra help, a little more technical assistance. That's really why we wanna hear from you. Um, again, as I, as I said, that I would continue to mention it, those live Q&A sessions, will put contact information for us um, in the chat and in the presentation later on to stay in touch no, no organization is too small to apply. And we'll get into a little bit about how we can make this opportunity work for everyone. 
And we'll talk more about the specifics of the ARP program and its support for operating costs near the end of our presentation. Our regular annual grant programs provide project support, and we'll walk through the details of our annual programs now just to make that sure that you're staying engaged with our agency well beyond this upcoming opportunity. So with that, I'll pass it over to my wonderful colleagues, Andy and Cheryl. Thank you, Ben. And can we go to the next slide, Charlie? Thank you very much. We're going to provide a brief overview of NEA funding opportunities before we focus on the ARP grants, as Ben said. And for those of you new to engaging with us, we want you to understand about all the different types of support you might be eligible to request in addition to the ARP funds. Generally, as Ben noted, our funding supports arts projects. When we get to the ARP section of this presentation, you'll see that we are supporting operating costs. And that's reflected in the asterisk on the right-hand column of the screen. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the types of organizations that are eligible to apply for our funding. Eligibility is open to tax-exempt organizations, including 501c3 nonprofits, units of state or local government, including local arts agencies and educational institutions, and federally recognized tribal communities or tribes. On the right side of the screen, you'll see examples of things that we're not able to fund, and that includes general operating support, except for the ARP support, as we've noted, and certain waivers that I'll get to in a minute. We also cannot fund individual artists, commercial activities, or fiscal sponsors. And the full list of items is published in our guidelines on our website at arts.gov. And I wanna clarify that asterisk on general operating support. We do have new legislation related to allowing previously awarded project grants to be used for general operating support in response to COVID-19. So if you have a previously funded award, you might be able to transition that into general operating support. You'll need to work with our grants office on that. But going forward, all of our FY22 grant applications will continue to be for project-based applications. Can we go to the next slide, please? There are certain requirements you must meet in order to be eligible to apply for an NEA grant. You have to be a 501c3 nonprofit at the time of application, and you must have a three-year history of arts programming. These two bullets seem to confuse a lot of people. You do not have to have the 501c3 before you have the three-year history of arts programming. You can get that 501c3 nonprofit 10 minutes before you hit the application submit button. As long as the 501c3 status is in place and you have the three-year history of arts programming, and you're in compliance with reporting requirements for previous awards, and you have one-to-one -one match on your normal NEA grants, you are fine. As I noted for our regular grant programming, you must provide a one-to-one -one cost share or match of non-federal funds. The match can be achieved in a variety of ways, including earned income through ticket sales or in-kind donations of space or a combination but the ARP funds are non-matching. You will not have to provide any sort of a match for the ARP funds. Next slide, please, Charlie. Thanks. So our grant review process includes three levels of review. The first level is a citizen panel, which is made up of experts in the field, whether they're paid professionals or not. And all of our panels are diverse in terms of geography, gender, ethnicity, and expertise. Panel recommendations are then submitted to the National Council on the Arts for their review and approval. And then the NEA chairman provides the final review and approval. If you're interested in being part of this process, we are always looking for new panelists. And we'll talk a bit more about how to volunteer to serve at the end of this presentation. And one other comment on our process, panel feedback is always available to applicants. If you apply and you're not recommended for a grant, we really encourage you to reach out to your staff contact. It can be helpful to hear what parts of your application resonated with panelists and what things they might have had questions or concerns on. And I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Great, thank you, Andy. So um, these are the different funding categories offered by the NEA. Partnership agreements, which are only available to the designated state arts agencies, such as our host, the Alaska State Council on the Arts, and the six US regional arts organizations. NEA has 
several funding opportunities for organizations, and they include grants for arts projects, Challenge America, Our Town, and research grants. These are the largest grants we offer, and nonprofit organizations receive the bulk of our direct funding. Grants for individuals are limited to literature fellowships in prose and poetry. Generally, you can submit one application per year per organization. However, there are some exceptions to that rule, so make sure to check the guidelines for clarity. In addition, we have two honorific programs that offer recognition to jazz artists through our Jazz Masters program and the folk and traditional arts through our National Heritage Fellowships Program, which is the program I manage. Um, there are 11 uh, Alaskans who have received a National Heritage Fellowship, including Nathan Jackson, a Tlingit Alaskan woodcarver, Dolores Churchill, a Haida Cedar Bark Weaver, and Anna Brown Ellers, a Chilkat Weaver from Juneau, Alaska. Uh, next slide, please. As mentioned by law, 40% of NEA's grant funds are designated to the states and regions. The funding is awarded through the partnership agreement um, that goes to all 50 state government arts agencies, six territories, and six regional arts organizations. And through the partnership agreement support, the arts endowment makes the arts available in many more communities than it could through our direct grant programs. The color coding on this map aligns each state with its regional arts organizations, and Alaska is included in the WASTA region. And you can see that in the light green part of the map. Next slide, please. We have mentioned there are three primary funding programs for the arts and arts organizations, Challenge America, Grants for Arts Projects, and Our Town. And next, I'll hand it over to Andy, who will focus on some details about each program. Thank you, Cheryl. And next slide, please, Carly. Challenge America primarily supports small organizations to extend the reach of the arts to populations that are underserved. All grantees must address how their organization or audience has been underserved. And this is defined by our legislation and agency policy and refers to those whose opportunities to experience the arts are limited by geography, ethnicity, economics, or disability. All the awards are a flat $10,000 and require a one-to-one -one match. And the program includes an abbreviated application and robust technical assistance from staff. The deadline is typically in April of each year. Next slide, please. The Our Town program provides support for creative placemaking projects. The most simple definition for creative placemaking is about strengthening local communities through arts and culture. Creative placemaking is when arts, culture, and design activities are deliberately integrated into efforts that strengthen communities. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the NEA's largest funding stream, Grants for Arts Projects. Applications are submitted to one of 15 discipline programs at either the February or July deadline of each year. Funding is available for all stages of the artistic process, and that can include creation, presentation and exhibition, arts education and enrichment, as well as services to the field, such as conferences or professional development. All grants require at least a one-to-one -one match, and awards can, arrange, can range from $10,000 to $100,000, and the project timeline can be for up to two years. Next slide, please. We support projects in the Grants for Arts Projects category across 15 different disciplines that you'll see up on the screen, and the guidelines for each discipline are posted on our website. To apply, you would choose the appropriate discipline based on the content of your project, not necessarily your organization, but the discipline of the project you're proposing, and follow the guidelines and application instructions for that discipline. We encourage you to look through the discipline guidelines and then reach out to staff with any questions. Contact information for our full staff is available on our website. Cheryl? All right. 
So for the American Rescue Plan Awards, we have two ARP grant programs, each of which has its own deadline and requirements. The July 22nd deadline today is for local arts agencies who wish to run a sub-granting program. The August 12th deadline is for all other organizations, including local arts agencies seeking operational support. This category is not for sub-granting. Each program has its own award amounts and timeline, eligibility requirements, documentation, and reporting requirements. And next slide, please. The American Rescue Plan support is designated for very specific costs, salary support, fees and stipends for artists and contractual personnel, facilities costs, costs associated with health and safety supplies, and marketing and promotion costs. Next slide, please. Here are a few of the most common questions that we've been receiving. Um, so yes, you may apply for ARP funds, even if you've applied for and received NEA CARES Act funding or any other NEA grant or other federal relief funds like the Shuttered Venue Operator Grants or the Paycheck Protection Program. And there are no work samples that are required for the ARP applications. And then lastly, the question about whether or not at the difference between project-based grant budgets and general operating grant. In a project-based project grant, all of the costs must relate to the execution of a specific project. In an operations-based grant, eligibility costs are not tied to a specific project. Andy, next slide, please. Thank you, Cheryl and Charlie. Things to remember, do get started now to register with SAM.gov and grants.gov if you haven't already. The process can take some time and you need those registrations in place to submit an application to us. Late applications aren't accepted and we urge you to try to submit early so that if there are any tech issues, we can clear them up well before the deadline. And it's a two part application. And so the first part is, is the August 12th deadline, as you see here in the third bullet. The second part will depend on your organization name. And we have it divided up just so that the volume doesn't overwhelm us. And we'll go into that a little bit later. Next slide, please, Charlie. We have special ARP mailboxes where you can submit questions as you're going along and designated ARP telephone numbers too. Also, there are a wealth of technical assistance resources on our website. Next slide, please. Whichever program you decide to apply for, the process is the same. It's a two-part process. Part one is where you'll work with two federal government systems, the System for Awards Management, SAM.gov, and grants.gov. You're going to need the up-to-date registrations and the correct permissions through these systems to apply for funding. And then once you have your current accounts in both those systems, the actual form you submit for part one is very simple. It's called an SF-424 form. It's where you provide basic information about your organization, name, address, what the grant period you would like is, and it shouldn't take too long to fill out. You're not required to submit any specific details about your project during part one. Think of this step as submitting your intent to apply. It's a way to express your interest in submitting the full application, which Cheryl will now tell you about. Thank you. Next slide. So part two is the actual grant application form. It's where you will submit the bulk of your application and all of the specifics about the organization and our project. You'll put together your narrative, budget details on key personnel and your work samples. Oh, well, if you're doing a project grant, you would use work samples. Um, the grant application form is submitted through our own Arts Endowment online platform, which is called the Applicant Portal. 
the guidelines for each of our funding programs, which are all posted on our website, arts.gov, include step-by-step -step instructions on using the applicant portal and how to apply. The instructions for part two include applicant instruction, include an applicant instruction document. This document goes through all of the questions you'll need to answer. The applicant instructions document includes the questions themselves, as well as helpful tips, screenshots of the applicant portal, and the character count for each application field. So you can compile all of your applications content and then enter that information into the NEA's applicant portal during the designated time frame. Next slide, please. We would love for you to stay connected with us. We release regular newsletters that highlight upcoming grant program deadlines, as well as events and resources. It's a great way to keep up with what's going on with the Arts Endowment and field news from around the country. So please subscribe. You can go to our website at arts.gov. And at the bottom of the home page is a button for newsletters. You can click there and sign up for any newsletter topics that most that interest you most. Next slide, please. And so one last reminder we mentioned at the top here, we are always looking for new voices to bring into our panel process. It's a great way to connect with us and to learn what the process is like from the other side. We have been told that it's a great professional development opportunity. And if you're interested, you can fill out a form on our website at the URL listed here or contact us directly. Next slide. All right, so now we're ready to move on and get into the Q&A session. Great, thank you so much, Cheryl and Andy. Charlie, maybe we could stop sharing just so we could, perfect, see everyone's faces. Uh, if folks want to just start putting questions in the chat, or if if we prefer, you know, just we can use the raise hand function and just unmute. Um, I know that was a lot of information and it takes some time to think of, to digest everything and, and think of questions. Pause for just a second, just to let people, if you want to put things in the chat, just while we wait and you gather after being bombarded with all that information, I think one thing that's front of mind I know is okay, so I have all this information. I know when the deadline is, how much money should I apply for, right? So we have the $50,000 level, the $100,000 level, $150,000 level. And as you heard during the presentation, we're only able to fund at the level for which you apply. So it's important to choose the number that's right for you. And I frame it that way because it really is a decision that's gonna be unique to your budget and your needs when you think about your operating support. But what I really always want to stress is that no part of the application and certainly not this part is meant to be a gotcha question. There should be no thought in the back of your mind where you're thinking, am I asking for too much? My neighbor needs more than I do. None of that. This is their three parts. There are three stages of funding in order to be flexible. And but we're also mindful that $50,000 might not be right for your organization. It might not, it might be too much. So with that in mind, I want to remind you that you can apply $50,000 over two years, so $25,000, $25,000, and also apply for funding through the, your state arts agency. And Andrea, once we're done with a little bit of Q&A, we'll talk about the opportunities um, there. Think about Westaf, think about local, and we'll make sure, again, that there's an opportunity for everyone to apply. So... A uh, question coming in, is ARP available for general operating support for new applicants? Yes, absolutely. We're excited to hear from new organizations. Andy already put it in the chat. So thank you, Andy. I'll just reiterate, as you may have experienced during CARES funding, that there was a requirement um, that you had to have received NEA funding within the last four years. We're excited to hear from new organizations. We're mindful of the fact that if you haven't applied, as we've said, if you haven't applied for federal funding before, this can be a daunting process. So we want to hear from you. If you've applied before, but you just want to check in with us, please do um, drop by again. I said, I guess we're. this will be the third time I'll say it because I really do mean it. Come by those live Q&A sessions. We really do want to see folks uh, there just listen in if you'd rather just hear what questions are 
front of mind for others. Any other questions in the chat? Or again, if you're more comfortable, please use the, the raise hand feature and we can do questions that way. Here's a question that came in. We started a SAM workspace application for the regranting version of ARP, but have determined that we'd rather apply for the other version. I think my understanding, Andy and Cheryl, and correct me, is that they should continue on that having a, a SAM.gov, SAM and grants.gov application is is good for, for any purpose, but. Well, if you haven't submitted your application, it sounds like what you're saying is that you were originally applying for the local arts agency subgranting opportunity, but didn't go through with it all the way. Am I getting that correct? Yes. I think it's and, whether, it, whether they need to remove it from the workspace is the. That I don't know because I'm not a technical expert on workspace, but definitely you can apply through the other opportunity with the August 12th deadline if you haven't submitted for today's deadline. Can and you, yeah, go ahead, Andy. Sorry. I was going to say, and if you get us your email address, we will find out the answer and get back to you about whether you have to remove the materials that are already in your workspace. Yes. And when it comes to Sam, thank you, Burl, for adding in. You know, that that navigating SAM and grants like of is a formal process. And as Andy said, we encourage you to start as soon as possible. If you haven't, those are general federal government websites. So we're not able to see the back end and get into the real technical assistance work. We've developed a page on our website just about navigating those with contact information for both of those processes. So if you haven't done it before, definitely encourage you to dig in um, and see, you know, don't want to leave any of these things to the last minute in case you do run into any just technical hiccups with the website. So a question about how will the NEA prioritize who gets funded through ARP? So we definitely encourage you to take a look at our website the guidelines and the criteria. Think about um, how general operating support connects to your overall mission and how you serve your community. I've heard Andy speak quite eloquently about how to create a, a real narrative and communicate to panelists when it comes to general operating support. So maybe Andy, if you don't mind. Happy to. Um, so the two criteria for the ARP program are actually the same as the two criteria for all of our grants programs, uh, artistic excellence and artistic merit. And we know it's easy to write about those two things when you're writing perhaps about a ballet that you want to fund or a symphony presentation or a poetry reading, but how do you do that when you're writing about rent or mortgage or the gas bill? Um, you can do that. You can write compellingly because what you're talking about is the impact that this funding is going to make on your organization and how you serve your community. If you're using this funding to help pay for someone's salary, talk about the difference that that position makes in your organization and what it will let you accomplish. Talk about what it means to keep your building running and open and operating to serve your constituents. Talk about the community that you serve and what it means to have your organization in that community. So what we are funding is your general operations, your existence. Talk about the importance of your organization's existence in your community and how this funding can help. Cheryl, I know you've been interacting with a lot of, of applicants through our, our email. Any additional thoughts there? Oh, I would just um, add to a couple of things that have been stated. Um, I think that the, for one thing, there's, there is something you want to keep in mind as you're picking out your number uh, for funding, 50,000, 100, or 150. You want it to be exact. So it might use some creative, I don't know, um, uh, accounting there. So it, it must reach to, it can't be $49,800 or $49,999 exactly 50,000, exactly 100, exactly 150. Um, and you really wanna do that because it, I think it, it will mark you as ineligible if you, if you don't get that um, done right uh, correctly. Um, and then I don't have much to add. I thought what Andy said about writing compellingly is really, um, really great. Um, I actually I want to add one thing to what I already said, <laughs> if that's okay, is Go one ahead. of, in terms of artistic merit, 
please do talk about your stewardship of federal funds and what systems you have in place to manage those funds responsibly, because that is another aspect of the review. I don't want to overlook that. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Andy. Uh, a question about operating support is crucial for many nonprofits, but programs like this that focus on it are rare. What steps could we take to encourage that continuation of this type? So general operating support for funding beyond the pandemic? I, I sit in my or the small corner of the agency that handles congressional affairs, but I think I'm not just biased. Tell if you receive a grant for general operating support, or do you value the NEAs or or at any level through Westaf, um, through if you're applying with Andrea, let your member of Congress know. This is so. This is um, at the end of the last calendar year, as you heard, Congress granted our the agency, the ability to grant a waiver. So if you've already received federal funding through the NEA, you could apply for a waiver and apply it to general operating support because they understood that so many um, of our cultural spaces were closed and it just didn't make sense to continue with project-based support. Same goes when we think about the purpose of American Rescue Plan funding. Again, so it's your ability to come out on the other end of the pandemic and the ability to reopen your doors. So, if you value and, and, and see a specific importance of general operating support, please you know, let your member of Congress know, let the entire Alaska delegation know. Um, we understand um, what it means, but right now we do, you know, generally speaking, as you heard, fund on a project basis. It's kind of a general question that might benefit everyone about where applicants get most tripped up. So I don't know, Andy or Cheryl, what you've seen. If I think Cheryl, a great, pointer of, of make sure that number is 50, not 49,999. Any additional thoughts there, Cheryl or Andy? Common mistakes? Budgets well, are definitely a common mistake and, and not writing to the review criteria and, and not being specific with details. Let the panelists know that you know your community. Yes, um, I think in terms of working on the application, definitely if you haven't done before, so we have this two-step process, the intent to apply, right? The SF-424 step one, and then we have part two where that's the bulk of it. Um, I, so we mentioned that there are instructions in the document that you wanna take a look at. It really is uh, where you'll get most of your tips and information about how to fill out um, this application. And that's downloadable on our website. So part two, um, don't forget to sort of go to that part. Um, the other thing I think, if you, are, if you have received federal funding um, relief efforts, um, you'll just wanna make sure that the, the funds are, are not the same um, when you're applying. So. So it can be, you, so you can receive funding um, from your from the Alaska State Council on the Arts, um, and it can be federal funding. But you and you want to make sure, um, at least through their guidelines, that that's that is okay for our purposes. The NEA does not um, preclude you from applying from those funds, but each um, entity is different. Uh, so there might be specific things that you need to um, think about when you decide which one you're going to or if you can go to both. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Andy. And we have a couple of specific questions, but I think the answers will be, we can apply generally and will benefit everyone. So if I think it's worth um, reading these, um, I'm from Cook Inlet Housing Authority. We are a tribally designated housing entity an instrument, and an, instrumental, an instrument of the state of Alaska created by state, the state legislation. We also have been deemed a charitable organization by the IRS, however, when you're not a 501c3. So if you remember, generally speaking, we do require that um, applicants are federally registered 501c3s, or as this person points out, a government entity, tribal organization. Are, is this person eligible to apply? I think this is a great example, and, and Cheryl, chime in if you've come across this in your work, or Andy, I think this is a great reason to say, get in touch with us. Get, send a note to that contact us page on our website. If you have 
kind of an, I, I don't I don't mean this in a derogatory way. If you have a niche question that really our grants office is going to have to wrestle with, it's a great reason um, to drop by one of those Q and A sessions. But really send us a note um, that contact us page, and we'll make sure that a grants officer is you know pays close attention to this and gives you the right answer. But Cheryl, I don't know if something like this and in folk and traditional arts have come up before. Just want to give you space to not to put you on the spot, but just in case. I will say I haven't seen this exactly. So, and and if it came to my desk, if it came to my inbox, I would go directly to the grants office. So, so uh, but is right on for that for that. Yeah, and just again a reminder to as these questions come up, if you don't have them, get in touch with us, send a note. Um, and we'll make sure we get back to you. Another specific question about um, having lost theater in a fire. I'm very sorry to hear that. I had a, a house fire as a child. So so really, that's awful. Can we get funds for renting a new facility? Can these funds be used for new expenses like additional staff or is it funding current costs? So rent, right? Absolutely. Andy, Andy and Cheryl, I see nodding faces. Um, Yes, uh, so existing staff, new staff, bringing part-time staff up to fuller or full-time are all allowable expenses. Right, so I think it's the for only thing, everyday operational costs. It's for things that you do every day. Right, so there's no, no construction, right, Andy and no. Cheryl? But, but, you know, rent, um, mortgage, um, just mortgage principal, not mortgage interest. And absolutely, when you think about salaries, if you had to furlough staff, if you had to move staff to part time, and these dollars are really meant to get on the other side of this pandemic. So I think you're thinking about it in exactly the right way. So I think we have some, some more time before Andrea takes over and, and tells you a little bit more about the funding opportunities at the state level. Um, just want to give people time to put some questions in the chat. Um, I think, you know, one question that we often get asked is, I'm a small organization, I'm volunteer run, I have one permanent staff, do I really have a chance? Is it worth it to me? And what we want to do is make it worth it to you. Um, we understand that, you know, meeting Cheryl, meeting Andy, they're wonderful colleagues, but it's not the same as receiving $50,000. We get it. But at the same time, we want to make sure that there's a return on investment for you, even if you're not successful this time around. And that when the February Grants for Arts Projects deadline rolls around, that you're saying to yourself, it was a lot of work, but I got my, my DUNS number, I'm good to go on, on SAM and grants.gov, and I'm going to apply again. So we want to make sure that you're meeting us, you're dropping by those, those Q&A sessions, and you're meeting people, and you feel like you have a relationship, and you do have a relationship with my colleagues and me at the NEA, and that there is, again, a return on investment when you choose to apply. We're mindful of the fact that just applying, if you're a small organization, is a real undertaking. You might have to take time out of your day that you would be doing other work. We, we hear you. Um, we want to stay in touch and make sure that you have the technical assistance resources you need. But maybe I'll, Andy or Cheryl, any advice for a small organization? Um, first of all, believe in yourself. Um, you are at no less of a competitive advantage or disadvantage than anybody else coming into this program. So everybody is on a level playing field. And I would recommend that anybody come to the Zoom office hours. Also, we have a bunch of videos that we haven't been talking about where our program specialists have been doing one to two to three minute videos on different aspects of the application process that really hold your hand as you walk through it. So those might be fun to watch if only to see endowment employees in their own homes. Um, and then what was the other? I was working on responding to something in the chat, so I didn't hear everything that was no, going no, on. Just, just, what else did just, I miss? Just thinking about advice for, you know, that we hear, is it, do I really have a chance? I'm a small Absolutely, yeah. you have a chance. Abs you Absolutely. And if Andy believes in you, what else do you need? Yeah. Cheryl, anything, any other advice for a small organization who's wondering, is it really worth it for me to apply? Yes, I think... One of the things that people have been paying attention to is the one award uh, um, reporting requirements. Um, you'll want to take a look at that. You'll want to take a look at, um, at the review, the application review, um, artistic excellence, artistic merit. Um, and 
the other things to consider when you're thinking about even a smaller organization, uh, you have up to two years. Uh, so the period of performance can be 12 months, 16 months, up to 24 months, right? Um, and, and what does that mean when you, when you take $50,000 and spread that over the course of, of 24 months? Um, so there's lots of things to sort of, uh, you can wrestle with um, and, and think about. Uh, but the, what I think is important is, as Andy said, like these are, this is still competitive for you and is isn't just for the big, big guys. Um, this is, we try, we're trying very hard to make sure that this does reach um, small urban and rural um, organizations. Thank you so much. Andy, do you have a, Something no, I was going to ask Charlie if he could put slide 15 up for us again. We had a question in the chat from someone asking what constitute, constituted allowable GOS expenses. I mean, and why, while Charlie does that, if it's, <coughs> excuse me, while it's available, a question about um, artist fees and, and consultant salaries. So I think, you know, artist fees, right? Absolutely. Um, I think consultant salaries, I, I don't see any, but Andy or Cheryl, when we're thinking about consultants. As long as it's for work that the organization does on a regular basis. Yes, as, as long as it's not for a special project, but it's for the organization's ongoing work. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Right, and we'll make sure that these slides, you'll receive them after the fact, so don't feel like you have to scribble down furiously before um, Charlie takes the slide away, but just to give you a sense. A question about how this is different from WESTAF and ARP funding. So as part of all of our grant making, by law, the National Endowment for the Arts makes 60% of those funds directly to organizations, and the remaining 40% flows through the regional arts organizations like WESTAF and state arts agencies. So it's all part of the same federal dollars. It's just administered differently. And really, we're so grateful to our regional and state partners and, and really Andy, who brings us all together um, to make sure, because so often it's the folks at the regional and the state level who know, uh, you really know their artistic uh, communities better than we do at the federal level. Thank so you, Charlie. I think you can bring all of us back now. And I was just going to add that the other difference from the West Half funding is that deadline is closed. So. There you, you go. Haven't applied for there it you now, go. You're not going to be able to. Thank, thank you, Ben. <laughs> I, having applied for one, I can. I there you experience. go. Sorry, sorry for that. That bad <laughs> news. If you hadn't applied, but certainly continue to to stay in touch with West Af as those. As I said, that will always be the case. That what what we say in our little business. That's the sixty forty split, um, and we'll never do anything to disrupt that. So if you didn't apply for a West Af grant this time around, be on the lookout during our regular Grants for Arts projects. But I think we're right around the time at which I think we were to pass it back to Andrea to talk about the opportunities in the state. Um, we want to give if folks, and if folks have questions that come up, I don't want to disrupt Andrea's presentation, but we'd be happy to answer in the chat as well. Thank you, Ben and Andy and Cheryl for this very informative presentation and the walkthrough and is so um, it can be complicated, and I appreciate the clarity you've brought today, especially with the visuals of the slides. And um, for all of us who are on the call, I I hope you'll feel comfortable to reaching out um, in the Zoom in meetings. I know that we will. Uh, I plan to drop in uh, because, of course, we have questions and order to serve you better in understanding these grant categories. So I really appreciate everything that you um, presented today and the specific questions that you answered. And I'm glad to see there are more coming. So my portion is not a slide presentation and it's not that long. So we can get back to Q&A. And I would love that because I, I would rather hear um, what your interests are and um, what, you, what everyone on the um, call today would like to hear as clarifications. So of that 40% award to state arts agencies, the amount that the Alaska State Council on the Arts will receive is $749,000. And we are currently working with the endowment 
around a budget plan and a spending plan and reviewing our existing grant categories to figure out the most efficient way to distribute funds from that amount. Um, regardless of budget size, organizations would be eligible and those funds would also support day-to-day uh, -day operations and jobs as you saw in the list of eligible costs that was presented um, that Andy uh, and Cheryl talked about. So those, if you wanted to go back and look at those slides, we have the same guidelines for eligibility with the subgranting that we're doing. Um, that grants plan will be finalized in August. We have an upcoming council meeting to discuss that plan um, at, uh, tomorrow. And that information will be posted on our website. So notices about funding and deadlines, and they also appear in our monthly newsletter and you can sign up for that. On the agenda is the link, but maybe we can have that link put into our uh, chat box as well. And fortunately with the increase in staff, we're getting better at having a website that is actually helpful. And um, there will be pages that focus specifically on the ARP funding um, so that you'll be able to get the information you need when you look back at that at the end of August. If you're signed up for the newsletter, then you should automatically receive our monthly um, news notices, short notices that often contain funding and deadline information that is called of note. And if you're not receiving it, please get in touch with us because um, that is where you'll learn about um, deadlines that have a quick turnaround like the West Staff Grant um, ARP program, for example. Um, I would encourage you to talk with us one-on-one -on -one about your specific um, funding uh, plans and projections, because often when we meet with potential grantees, if you're a new grantee, that conversation can take about 45 minutes to an hour. And I know many of you last year um, had consultations with us and we talked about immediate and long-term plans for funding. Um, the cornerstone of our grants programming is operating support but it, there is a pathway to get there. And we'd love to work with you, each of you and your organizations and regardless of your current status or your current budget in order to um, map out that plan and, and um, go through in detail what each grant is about. So I didn't do that today because there, we do have so many grants programs, but um, I, wouldn't, I wanted to note too that our two grants administrators are on the call today. Laura Forbes is our Arts Education Program Director, and Charlie Sears is our Community Arts Program Director. And I was a grants administrator for 10 years and program director. So we all three work collaboratively on grants management because we are a small team. So um, we can respond, respond um, in, in, a, in a more dynamic way than if you were just reaching out to one of us so um, I would encourage you to start, start with one of us and then we'll start the ball rolling with um, what uh, you're looking for. Thank you. Back to Q&A. Did that give you a chance to get caught up then with any questions that have come in? Yeah, I think now Thank that we have time, for um, our website. I think we have, we have a couple of questions that you might wanna, before we jump back in to one, there were a couple in the chat. Um, that are Alaska specific. Yeah, well, so the ASCA grants are separate from the National Endowment for the Arts grants. They're totally okay. separate processes. And then so whether the ASCA grants all, are also for operating support or just for our project specific is the follow-up. Well, our, our annual and biennial operating support grants are for operating support. And then our, some of our smaller quarterly grants um, community arts development grants, workshop grants, uh, professional development grants are more like project grants. And Andrea, maybe you wanna describe that a little more articulately than I just did. Thanks, Ben. The community arts development grant can serve as an operating support grant. And the uh, basis of that is a need in the community for underserved art forms and underserved initiatives and underserved communities. So we work closely with applicants in how that is presented. 
So it's somewhat project-based, but we don't offer grants that um, would involve the creation of work specifically or solely. And I would defer to Andy for that definition or Cheryl to um, help define that because that does come up quite often. Um, there are some great ideas that we haven't been able to fund because they're solely about a creative, the creation of work. Um, community arts development grants are different in that they require community engagement. So is there a way to think about that, Andy? And Cheryl, could you mull that around so it's a little clearer? So if you're talking about funding to individuals? Is yes. So any funding that to individuals using an, that a state arts agency makes using endowment funding has to be for a particular project or activity. There has to be a result. It cannot be based on the quality of the artist's prior work or achievement. So it can't be for an artist fellowship, but it could be for a reading, a performance, um, design or development of a curriculum. It has to be for a thing that can be evaluated based on those two review criteria, artistic excellence and artistic merit. And usually there's some sort of a performance or a presentation or, an, or a lecture or an unveiling of, a, of something involved. And so the artists are being paid for their time. It's a stipend, it's not a fellowship. Thank you, Andy. That does help clarify the difference between routine development of work, of a body of work versus getting your work out there. On that note, we had a question about general operating support and artist fees. So the question is, we present several music performances each year. Are artist fees for the performances considered part of general operations or are they, quote, specific programmatic activities, which the NEA's uh, ARP guidelines say are not allowed? So any, I know you touched on it, Andy, um, but any more on artist fees or Cheryl to try to help clarify? I would defer to Cheryl on this one. No problem. Uh, so actually, this is a great question and we've been hearing um, it quite a bit. Um, and this is where I will plug um, the FAQ page on our website, which I'm actually gonna refer to. And Ben, I don't know if you can grab that, put that in the URL. Um, so, the question, how do you incorporate artist fees um, into operational support? So there's a couple of examples that we have in our, in our FAQ. Um, so, and, and I'll sort of read this. If you're including artist fees, you should outline what work the artist will be paid for, such as performances, presentations, publications, et cetera. However, since the costs are not project-based, do not include fees or stipends that are tied to a specific project. An example of this would be, a choral ensemble plans to pay its ensemble members to rehearse and perform over the course of the period of performance. The organization includes a line item for the ensemble member payments in the budget. So it, it's a payment, but that's included in your budget, but it's not tied to a project. Another example, a publisher plans to pay the writers whose work will be featured in books or journals um, released throughout the period of performance. What the organization will do is include a line item for payment to the writers in the project budget rather than listing in the, in the budget, rather than listing the particular books or the authors. So you're listing artist fees, you're not mentioning the specific project. And, and if you want even more, if you have questions as you're developing your application, again, um, that's where you would go to our contact emails or um, phone numbers, because uh, we have specialists who will be able to sort of dig into the details on that sort of thing with you. Perfect. Thank you so much for referring to that. And I put the FAQ in the chat. I'll just, I know we've done it before, but um, just the 
contact information on how to um, get in touch with a specialist. And, and certainly a specialist will be glad to make the connection to our grants office if you do have any of those real granular questions about eligibility. Um, you know, again, please be in touch. And Andrea, thank you so much for the plug for the, the live Q&A sessions. We all absolutely hope to, to see a lot of you there. Um, I'm gonna pause just a, a brief moment to um, allow people to think of questions or, or Andy or Cheryl, if you have anything that you see as, as you talk to folks in the field that is front of mind that you think we haven't covered. I just noticed Jean's question here. Yes, the State Council on the Arts applications and the NEA grant applications are separate, although we are talking about working through the same guidelines with the ARP funds. Great, thank you, Andrea. So, Andy or Cheryl, any frequently asked questions, hot button issues that you see? Cheryl has been manning one of the email inboxes that we um, put in the chat there. So she really sees these questions develop in real time. And we find so often that if one person's hearing the question, someone else is too. So I don't know, either of you, if there are, are questions that you hear time and time again that you think the group might benefit from? Well, one of the things that just came to mind, and I'm just trying to recall all of the organizations that are here with us today. Um, I don't know if there are any universities, um, but we mentioned educational institutions are um, eligible, um, universities being one of them. And uh, sometimes there are centers or theaters associated with the university and you might have to have an independent component. So we don't do fiscal sponsorship, but we do in, do independent components. Um, and that is a determination that can be made through uh, a answering a series of questions um, very quickly. So it's not going to SAMP.gov, it's not going to grants.gov, it's just coming to us um, and asking, is this appropriate um, as an independent component? And you can email our contact there and, and, the, and we'll sort of look through and maybe it's already um, listed as one. And that's because a university might have a performing arts center or an art museum, you know, several entities like that who all want to apply. And, and as Cheryl mentioned, generally it's one application per entity. But if you can make the determination through answering those questions that these entities are very separate within the university structure, you might be able to each apply. And we have a question about how to apply broadly, but avoid overlapping costs. As we said, we want to make sure that you're applying for other parts of the federal government, at the regional level, at the state level. But of course, you don't know if your application will be successful. If you're fortunate enough to, you know, hit the lottery and 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 get applications at every single possible opportunity, and you're thinking about your mortgage for your building, how do you avoid overlapping costs? So I think. In terms of the actual details of that, my understanding is that that can happen effectively in real time after you understand the different the different grants that you've received. But in terms of the actual nuts and bolts of that, Andy or Cheryl, any thoughts on, on how to reveal and how that actually comes to be? Well, certainly if we're talking salary or mortgage or rent, as Ben said, you could probably negotiate with us or the other funder to work things out if you wind up getting both grants. But one way at the front end at the application stage would be to apply for January, February, and March from one funder and April, May, and June from the other funder. So right off the bat, there are no overlapping costs because you're talking about different time periods for the expenses. Andrea, from your perspective, any thoughts on how to avoid overlapping costs if someone is applying through you all and to us? Um, ben, I'd like to think about that. Uh, I was responding to Aaron in the chat box. Oh, my apologies. I didn't mean to catch you off guard there. That's my fault. I just wanted to make sure that Aaron knew. Um, and so Aaron, I responded to you, but really that's for everyone. So um, I hope that's helpful. Sure, I think, um, yeah, go ahead. 
avoid overlapping costs. Is Try to, to avoid. So we want to encourage right in, folks to apply to you, apply to us. But if they're thinking about salaries, how do they mm -hmm. avoid overlapping costs? And and Andy said that you know there's an opportunity to work together, but maybe apply for you know January, February, March with us. You know the next three months with you. But any additional thoughts on how to apply broadly but avoid that problem? Yes. Okay. So it. It helps us to think about it as a lasagna, not a soup. And so we think about layers that there's the seasonal lasagna and that's one of them. And then there's another seasonal lasagna and that's another way of tracking funds. So um, the way that I would suggest is to be in connection and in communication with, with um, ASCA regarding what you have applied for in your other operating grant requests. And we, we have a question about the shuttered venue operators grant. So that's a program administered by our friends at the Small Business Administration. I'm not an expert in that program. We're very glad that it exists. And of course, we would, if you are receiving SVOG funds, still apply through us. You are absolutely eligible, but I'm unable um, to answer that exact question on the timing. Um, if other folks in the chat have experience with the SVOG program would be glad for you to chime in, but I would hesitate to, to answer a specific question about another agency's program. I don't want to put our managing director at Perseverance on the spot, but Frank, I'm practically certain that SVOG funds are uh, eligible through the end of 2022, aren't they? Uh, so it uh, the Time period changes uh, with the receipt of the second round of funds. And that, if I remember correctly, that extends the uh, eligibility period out to the end of 2022. But the best answer is ask the SBA, probably. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Glad for that information. But when in doubt, ask the agency. We don't want to steer you in the wrong direction. But most importantly, if you have received SVOG funds, hopefully the SVOG funds are actually making their way towards you first. Second, if you received PPP funds, anything for the federal government, um, a previous NEA grant, you are still eligible to apply to us. Just make sure you avoid those overlapping um, funds, but please apply broadly. So and I guess you... apropos of that, uh, the CARES grants to arts organizations needed to be expended. I, I guess I know for Perseverance, that grant period ended in, in June with the, that fiscal year. So there can't really be an overlap there because that, that period's over. Right, great, thank you. So I think we have, thank you, Andrew, for, for helping in the, in the chat as well. I, won't, I don't wanna say it takes a village, but maybe it's true. Um, <laughs> I just want to pause, give people time to, to ask, to think of any additional questions. We have a little bit of time, but again, if, if you don't think of your question now, don't fret too long about not having had the opportunity to do it, because then you'll go to one of our live Q&A sessions. You'll ask the question there. You can double up and ask the question to one of our email inboxes for ARP. Um, get in touch with a discipline specialist on our website. <coughs> Excuse me. Just, you know, again, lots of opportunities to ask your questions, no question too small. We wanna make sure that you're in a position to succeed. We have more information about, we're just turning this into a SBA workshop. I love it, making sure people <laughs> will have all the information they need. Thank you, Frank, for sharing that. So with that, with, with nothing else, maybe just pass it back over to, to Andrea and Ben. Well, Andrea, is there anything else you'd like to add? Thanks, Ben. Um, the learning opportunity here has really been incredible. And I know that um, the nuggets today will keep carrying through. It's really amazing to us um, when we see organizations beginning um, to jump into the grant application world um, and how that um, build every year just gets a little bit better and a little bit better. And that's what we're really here for. Um, so as, as um, offering that one more time as coaching, um, I hope that if there are questions that come up or even if it's not a grant deadline, that's actually the best time 
to have conversations about funding. Um, so please do stay connected um, with the endowment and please stay connected with the Alaska State Council on the Arts. And it's been a pleasure today. Ben? Very good. So then I guess in conclusion, I would just thank um, our wonderful staff at the State Council on the Arts, uh, Andrea, Laura, and Charlie for all that you have done to make this happen and all that you do. And I wanna thank Ben and Cheryl and Andy from the endowment. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to Alaska when circumstances permit. Um, and I'm certainly looking forward to going to our nation's capital again when circumstances permit. So one thing I think that I would point out as chairman uh, is, you know, the more demand we have for programs administered by the State Council on the Arts, and the same thing is true, the more demand that there is for programs administered by the National Endowment for the Arts, the more we can talk to our authorizing our authorizers in the state legislature and in Congress and ask for more money. You know, increased demand is the best metric to show that funding increases make sense. There's currently a substantial proposal for increasing funding to the endowment of, in, in before Congress. And Senator Murkowski has been very supportive of that. So even though it's frustrating, even though SAMS and EMS reach are daunting to work with, it there's an intangible benefit by you and your arts organization mastering that and becoming conversant in it and, and trying to get those funds in addition to the tangible benefit of getting those funds. Looking at the geographic diversity we have of participants on this call, you know, NACNIC, the Sitka, um, obviously Anchorage Fairbanks, Juno, uh, it, Homer, it's just really, really encouraging to see uh, people from across Alaska representing organizations from across Alaska, Kodiak. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for supporting your state arts agency and your national arts agency. Uh, this is the beginning of a conversation, obviously, and so the, I will probably be in some of these Q&As. Um, and in the meanwhile, we stand by to serve you, and I know Ben and Andy and Cheryl and their colleagues at the endowment stand by to serve you. So if there's nothing else, I will say uh, thank you again to everyone. Be well, go forth and get registered and get ready to apply for these funds, and you will likely get, many of us will get them, and we will do great work with them, I think. So thank you very much. Namaste, and have a good afternoon.